Good morning, faith community. Welcome to our Palm Sunday service. The day is coming and hopefully it'll be sooner than later that we will be able to regather here uh, as a body and worship Christ again. I also want to remind us this morning of a passage in Romans chapter 8. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Palm Sunday. This was a day when Jesus presented himself to Israel as their king. And he had just resurrected Lazarus from the dead. And you can imagine as this crowd is cheering on the road into Jerusalem, that Lazarus must have been there as well, rejoicing at the gift of life that Jesus Christ gave us. And so on Palm Sunday, we celebrate the fact that Jesus was offering us beauty instead of ashes. He was uh, giving us joy instead of mourning. He was providing freedom rather than slavery. And he was healing rather than allowing brokenheartedness to remain. So we hope that you will be encouraged by the greatness of God's love and uh, that it will give you the power to carry you through difficult days and tough times. Also, we want to remind you that next Sunday is Easter, and even though we won't be able to meet together to celebrate, we can still gather together in our individual homes and marvel at the miracles Jesus wrought of life instead of death, of forgiveness instead of judgment, of hope instead of fear, of joy rather than sadness. So we hope that you'll join us for this special online Easter worship service. Johnny Zaccio, who was our most recent uh, worship pastor candidate is going to be leading worship for us uh, that Sunday morning. I'll be sharing with you from Acts chapter nine about the radical transforming power of the resurrected Christ who can take a man who is breathing out threats and murder against the church and convert him from Saul into Paul. And there'll be a special Easter video for Creation Kids and all of the families. So um, we hope that you'll join us and, and, and we hope that you'll prepare for that Sunday so how can you do that? Well, let's take a look at this video. Honey, come on. Easter service is starting. Good morning, everyone. He's risen. What? Folks, it doesn't matter if you dress up or dress down. We want you to grab your Bibles, get a good breakfast together, and then sit down and, and watch us at 930, either on the church Facebook page or you can go to YouTube. And, and let's worship Jesus together for Easter. And by the way, we haven't forgotten, today is the first Sunday of the month. Today is our normal communion Sunday. Uh, but since we're not together to partake of it together, we would like to encourage you um, as individuals, couples, families, to set aside one evening this week and take communion together. Keep in mind that the very first communion was performed in a house, in the upstairs room. Jesus spent time with his disciples talking about the power of his gift of life. So here's three things you can do to prepare. First of all, ahead of time, gather some supplies. So that would include your juice, You'll want to have enough physical cups for everyone taking communion in your home. And lastly, you'll want some kind of bread. 
anything that represents something that is broken like the body of Christ. Secondly, when you take communion, look at the story in Luke 22. Read verses 14 through 18, where Jesus was willing to come to earth for us. Essentially, Philippians 2 is the passage that describes his uh, leaving heaven, his equality with God, taking on the form of a servant, being willing to even go to the point of death on a cross for us. And then thank God for a way he has made a difference in your life by being here and eat the bread together. After that, read verses 19 through 20, where we find that Jesus was willing to die for us in order to pay for our sins. And thank God for that sacrifice. Perhaps also think of specific sins he has covered for you and then drink the juice. When you're through with communion, remember that this is an important opportunity to help us prepare for not only communion with God, for a daily cleansed walk with him, but also for Easter. Now let's join Ethan and April as they lead us in a time of worship. Good morning, faith community. We feel so blessed to um, be sharing this time with you this morning. And we're going to start our worship um, with all creatures of our God and King. And we just want to um, remind you just to, to really focus on the words of this song, to think about God's goodness and his glory, and that he doesn't change, and he's still the same through whatever this... Um, whole process, however it ends, we know that God is unchanging and that he loves us and he's providing for us and protecting us. And so in your fear and in those moments of worry, um, we just encourage you to not forget how much God loves you and that he does not change. And so just worship with us through these lyrics this morning. of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, oh praise Him, hallelujah, thou burning sun with golden beams.
Soften my heart and break me apart. I need you to open my eyes and see that you're shaping my life. And all I am, I serve.
Good morning, Faith Community Church family. It's so good to be with you. And I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb, or perhaps considering the day, a palm branch, and guess that this is probably the most unique way that you have celebrated Palm Sunday. I mean, most people like to try and go to church on Palm Sunday to celebrate nearing Easter. And yet the church building is technically closed, and you and I are confined to our homes, and you're watching this now over the internet, who would have thought or predicted this six months ago or even a few months ago that this is the way we'd be spending Palm Sunday? And I'm feeling strange about the whole thing too because I'm sort of confined to this table. I like to typically stand up and walk around when I preach and I can't do that. Um, I have even been accused of pacing before. Uh, one comment card I, I got once, someone wrote on there, after seeing me preach on a stage where I was moving about quite a bit, the person said essentially that I was getting a little carried away with my movements and that I should try and limit how much I walk around. And I was thinking about that phrase this week, getting carried away. And it got me thinking that if you've ever been told that you're getting carried away, you probably can remember that it was not a positive comment. People weren't affirming you. They were essentially suggesting that you stop whatever you were doing. The, the idea of, of getting carried away is that there's something external that we're either excited about or concerned about or zealous for or committed to. Whatever it is, it's so impacting us that we are sort of losing our behavior or uh, who, who we are is being modified by this other thing. We're getting carried away. And I'm sort of an excitable person. I can easily get carried away, but some of you might not normally be that way at all. And yet here we are in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic. It's something none of us have ever experienced before. And you, maybe for the first time, have been feeling a little bit carried away. And, and it could be by a variety of things. Maybe you've been carried away uh, by your obsession with the news. You are constantly looking at the news sources and learning more and more about COVID-19. And you're not just keeping it within yourself for your own information. You're telling everyone about it and you're informing everyone of the latest. And you might just be getting a little carried away. Or maybe that's uh, you, the person that's uh, carried away over the toilet paper wars. Maybe you've gotten carried away over what I'm referring to now as quarantine quarrels. This is the fact that because sports are no longer on TV, you can't have that kind of live entertainment anymore. You've created your own sport, and the competition is this. See if you can insult or offend your spouse in a 24-hour period of time under quarantine more than they can offend or insult you. And actually, domestic violence and domestic issue cases have gone up. They've skyrocketed during this uh, home-in-place hunkering down that we've all been going through because we get a little carried away with these things. It's almost always negative, that phrase. And yet I was reading toward the end of Acts chapter 8 this week, and I was looking at the fact that the Bible says that Philip was carried away by the Spirit. Now, most commentators, and, and I believe that if you read this, it, it absolutely actually looks like Philip was transported by the Spirit, that he was literally carried away and put exactly where God wanted him to be. The Holy Spirit carried Philip away. And yet, whether it was a literal uh, carrying away or even just uh, sort of that figurative idea that, that Philip was so 
in tune with the Holy Spirit. He was so engaged and engrossed with God that he was doing precisely what God wanted him to do. And I was thinking about that and considering that that's probably the one and only thing that we could be carried away by and have it be a good thing, to be carried away by God, to be carried away by his Holy Spirit. I believe that even in crisis, even in the worst things that we could experience, if we allow ourselves to be filled and, and uh, by the Spirit and fulfilled by the Spirit and walking in the Spirit, that even in the moments of worst crisis, we can find joy and contentment and peace because that's what God provides. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to be carried away by your Spirit. As we look at Acts chapter 8 now, help us to see in there what it is that you would have us glean from this passage that we can directly apply to this time in home isolation and confinement. And as we're really praying and hoping for our own physical health, Lord, may you give us a spiritual health where it includes us abiding in your presence, being empowered by your spirit and leading wherever you take us. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his resurrection from the grave that we celebrate, especially now during this time of year. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus name. Amen. So Acts chapter 8, and there arose on that day, the same day Stephen was killed, a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So the church scatters. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul, now this is Paul, the apostle Paul, before he becomes a Christian. He's a Jewish religious zealot who is persecuting the Christians. In fact, it says in verse 3, Saul was ravaging the church. Entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now, as much as you and I are probably sick and tired of being stuck at home right now, I have a feeling that we would much rather be at peace here at home than be at home and have your front door knocked down and have someone pull you out of your home and throw you into prison simply because you are a Christian. So what I want to do this morning is spend the rest of our time looking at three ways that when we are carried away by the Spirit, these three things tend to be true. And I hope you get excited about them because I have been this week. The first thing is this. When you get carried away by the Spirit, oppression leads to opportunity. Think about what was happening in Acts chapter 8 from just a human fleshly perspective. Saul is ravaging the church and uh, there's so much persecution here. And Christianity is at risk of being destroyed. It, it, yes, it was budding, but it could have been stamped out. If Saul and the religious leaders of Judaism were uh, persistent enough, they could have stopped the spread of Christianity right then and there by simply snuffing everyone out. It seems like a devastating blow to the early church. However, how, what, what did the church do in response? It looked like major oppression, but they instead turned it into opportunity because they were, they were yielding uh, their will to God. And so the believers scattered, and what did they do? Verse 4 of Acts chapter 8. Now those who were scattered... Did they start a witness protection program and hide in a cave somewhere? No. They went around preaching the word. So the very thing that was getting them in trouble in Jerusalem, they, as they scattered about, they just kept on doing it. Philip, for example, went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds, with, uh, with one accord, paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them. So people were being healed from demon possession. And many were paralyzed. Many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. And so there was much joy in that city. So ultimately, the church, as they were being persecuted and oppressed, that oppression led to opportunity where the gospel was being proclaimed, people were being healed, they were believing in the good news of the gospel, and they were becoming believers who got to inherit eternal life. 
Now I want you to consider from a human perspective what we're facing today as a church around the world, but specifically here in America. If we were told six months ago that the government would essentially force churches everywhere to close their doors, you can't celebrate Easter together, you can't meet on Sunday mornings. If you were just told that with not a lot of explanation as to why, you would probably believe that we would be suffering some kind of major persecution, that this might be some kind of governmental death blow that's being laid out on the church. But that's not what I've seen, as COVID-19 has, in fact, caused us to have to close our doors. I haven't seen that at all. I haven't seen the church waving a flag, of a white flag of surrender. I've seen the church rise up and take advantage of the opportunity. Seems like oppression, but we're changing it and, and, and yielding our will to God. And we're saying, God, let's turn this into an opportunity. In fact, churches are going more public than they ever have in many ways. We're putting this online right now. We normally don't record our sermons with videos and put them online. Do you know that churches are doing this so much that Facebook and other streaming sites have been crashing and, and stopping and videos haven't been able to be uh, streamed accurately because churches, hundreds of churches, thousands perhaps, are now newly bringing the message to the online platforms. Churches have gotten really creative. I've seen drive-in movie theaters repurposed as church services, where everyone keeps their social distance, they stay in their car, but they tune their, their radio to a certain channel, and the preacher and the worship band is all being um, broadcast through these drive-in movies. With more time on its hands, I, I feel like I've seen the church get more involved in the community more than I've seen. Take a look at this video. Chappie and Misty live in Vista, and their street has been doing something really exciting on Sunday mornings. When we're not able to go to church, the neighborhood does church. We trust in our God. And through That is so exciting. Or how about this? Did you hear about the Christians in Georgia that organized uh, a, a rally in the parking lot of a Georgia hospital where they wanted to pray over the doctors, pray over the COVID-19 patients, and a full-on worship service erupted from this parking lot. called to be the hands and feet of Christ and uh, that's exactly what we did today was we bombarded heaven with our prayers we came and we I mean they were just medical staff was up on the roof just crying and bawling their eyes out we've already had testimonies come in from that it's just been a blessing this was all credited to the Lord and uh, what he did it was just phenomenal I have so enjoyed seeing how the church has been utilizing what feels like oppression. It feels like uh, limitations, restrictions, pressure being put on the church. And surely that's what Satan would like to see it as. But instead, we're seeing people use it as opportunity. Now, this might feel newer for America, but not just oppression, but persecution has been a commonplace occurrence all around the world for all of Christian, Christianity's history. I want you to watch this quick video from my friend, John. Well, good morning, Faith Community Church. My name is John Acord. My name is Shulam Acord. And we have a ministry called Shifu's International. Shifu's is Chinese for teacher, trainer, discipler, because the focus of our ministry is to go into the illegal underground churches in China and train pastors and church leaders. Now in the past, that was a fairly easy job. We could just go to China, rent out some rooms, and uh, people would show up by the droves and we could train them however we pleased. But it seems the new leader, uh, Xi Jinping, came into power. Everything, everything is almost impossible. And uh, he's trying to uh, get rid of the Christianity from China. So over the years, you've seen that the church is being uh, 
closed down and church buildings demolished and the crosses are being removed and Christians and leaders and uh, church leaders and preachers and pastors are being imprisoned and tortured. Nearly every church we've worked with has been raided by the police now and many of them shut down and even the pastor's homes taken away. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago when my wife and I were preaching, we were unaware of a couple of undercover police officers in the congregation. And later that afternoon, my wife was taken away by the police for an interrogation and all of our ministry was shut down. We just relocated into some smaller rooms and kept it going. Here's what I want to tell you. In America, we suffer oppression. Throughout the world, there's a lot of persecution. But whether you're being oppressed or whether you're being persecuted, it's always an opportunity for God to do something great. We serve a sovereign God. None of this is out of his control. We've seen him use persecution and oppression in mighty ways. For instance, since we cannot go to China as often as you, as you should be, we are having the groups come over here. We train them here in groups and send them back to train others. Uh, our website is loaded with uh, uh, hundreds of material that for them to use. And Johnny and I also train 300 people online weekly in, for an in-depth Bible study. This current situation in America is opening all new opportunities for ministry. Churches, when, the, when we get back together again, it's going to be powerful. Well, God bless you. Keep your eyes open as you go through the book of Acts for how God uses every oppression as an opportunity. So that's their story of how they take oppression and, and have seen it become opportunity for them and the Chinese brothers and sisters in Christ that they have ministered to and ministered alongside of. But what's your story? You might feel a lot of the oppression, the, the stifling of your lifestyle, the, the, the pressure of, of everything that, that this time that our country is going through is dealing with right now. But have you asked God for opportunity through it all? If not, I want to encourage you to do that. You might be surprised by, by how God begins to enlighten you. One of the things that I've been learning on the go, because I'll tell you, in seminary, I never took a course called How to Pastor During a Pandemic. So my whole world has been turned upside down in terms of what I always thought ministry is and will be forever and ever. I'm learning that what I need to be doing is instead of trying to get God to conform to what I want him to do, I need to figure out what God is doing in this world and join him in that. He is clearly up to something. And I don't want to sit here and twiddle my thumbs. I want to be about the ministry that God is about. So ask God, what are you doing, Lord? I don't want to feel this oppression. I want to feel like it's an opportunity to serve you. Next, starting in verse 9. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and, and amazed the people of Samaria. This is not a Christian. This is a, uh, a secular guy who has been uh, a sorcerer who sort of probably made a living with magic tricks and convincing people that he is a great showman. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. So they really attributed God's power to this guy, Simon, who's just doing all kinds of tricks. Verse 11, and they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, so Philip came in and started preaching the gospel. As he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed. Simon was now amazed himself by the good news of the gospel and the signs of and wonders that accompanied the ministry there. Verse 14, now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll talk more about that in a minute because that seems a little strange. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered the apostles money, 
saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness. Some translations say you are poisoned by bitterness and in the bond of iniquity, in the bond of sin. And Simon answered, verse 24, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now, before we hit the second main point of today's message, I want to address the elephant in the room. And that is the fact that it seems like the new believers in Samaria, they weren't receiving the Holy Spirit when they repented and placed their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, you and I know differently. We know that the scriptures tell us that we begin, we, we become indwelled by the Holy Spirit the very moment that we trust in Christ and are born again. But apparently here in Samaria, Peter and John have to show up sometime later and then lay their hands on them and, and pray that the Holy Spirit come and that uh, be received in their lives. Now, what's the deal? What's going on there? We have to remember that the book of Acts is descriptive more than it is prescriptive. In other words, it's a historical account of the early church and how it spread. What's great about that is we get to see the our origin story, spiritually where we came from. But the book of Acts is not filled with doctrine on how to live the Christian life or theologically what to understand about salvation. So there were things happening in this transitional time but between Judaism and everything that we've seen in the Old Testament and then everything that's to come in the established Christian New Testament. But when the apostles, when the disciples, when they were ministering in, in Acts, they didn't have the scriptures. They didn't have, that is, the New Testament to convey all this information and to have God's word as a solid um, standard of what the message was. And so it needed to be protected. God actually initiates in Peter's life, Jesus gives him the keys of the kingdom, so to speak, and says, hey, I'm going to give you a special authority during this time so that you can, uh, in my absence, as Jesus returns to the Father, that you can... Uh, oversee what's going on and make sure that the message essentially is protected, that the church remains unified. And so the apostles were going to where Philip had preached the word. Remember, Philip is a deacon here. He's not one of the disciples. And so you have John and Peter. They're essentially making sure everything is legit, that the message is unified, that God's word is being handled correctly, and that the believers truly are believing. And then, having determined that, they pray, lay hands over them and pray over them. So that's why we see this stuff happening in Acts that we don't see later on. Once the apostles die, once the New Testament is written, we, we don't have apostles anymore, and we don't need them because we have all of God's word right here. And in having that, that's what preserves the message. That's, is, this is our new standard, um, not what the apostles affirm or, or don't affirm. And so... This is it. So we don't have that same thing today. And the Holy Spirit does come on every individual and indwells every individual who simply uh, repents and puts their faith in Jesus Christ. So let's move on to the main point of this passage that I want to bring out. And that is that when we're carried, carried away by the Holy Spirit, that discernment leads to deeper discipleship. When you're carried along, carried away by the Holy Spirit, you begin to discern things that you might not otherwise. And that leads you to discipling people in real and radically life-transforming ways. You see, Simon was this secular sorcerer. He was a, a sinful guy. And when he believed and was baptized, well, it may not have been sincere because we begin to see his heart motive. His heart motive essentially is, hey, I want this power. I want to be able to perform these signs and miracles like the disciples are. I want to be able to lay my hands on someone and pray over them and they get, they get this Holy Spirit that gives them eternal life. I want that. I want to add that to my repertoire of, of tricks and make a, a killing off of that. And Peter discerned this and then discipled Simon in such a way he rebukes him and says, no way. 
no way, your heart is not in the right place. You need to repent. I know this is true with me. When I'm not walking in the spirit, when I'm just sort of being Justin and not allowing God to shape all of my thoughts and to, to, you know, if I'm not surrendering my will to his, when I engage with other Christians and I hear things that I know aren't right or hear things that are indicative of a lifestyle of sin, sometimes I just look the other way. I, I shake my head and I just look the other way. But when I'm walking in the Spirit, when I'm soaking up God's Word, when I'm abiding in, uh, abiding in Christ, and then I encounter other professing believers that look spiritually sick, I'm in tune with that. I discern that. And then I take along, I come alongside of that person and help to inform them in a way that is going to hopefully be used by God to transform them. You know, 1 Corinthians 2.14 reminds us that spiritual discernment comes from the Spirit and it, it happens only in a life that is born again and that is, is being uh, filled in, in someone who is walking in the Spirit. Hebrews 5.14 reminds us that as we desire spiritual maturity, the great depths of God's Word is, quote, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Do you do that? Do you ask the Lord to help you discern good from evil and know how to make right choices and know how to lead others? God's Word is very good at helping us with this. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, classic verse. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for, correct, for correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. We ought to discern others' uh, areas of growth areas and utilize the Bible to help disciple them. Simon answered Peter after Peter told him, hey, you got to repent. You got to get right with God. Simon says, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you've said may come upon me. In other words, Simon was at least a little bit receptive to say, I hear what you're saying. I don't want to be far from God. Here's my encouragement for you. Right now, we're not able to be around very many people being homebound and um, constrained by COVID-19. So in a way, we're feeling limited. But when this is all over, we're going to have an opportunity to have coffee sitting next to someone again in a coffee shop crowded with people. And instead of talking about the weather, instead of just shooting the breeze, we, I, I, I hope that we take advantage of our time together where we can talk about real things, where we can be iron sharpening iron. When someone says something that is, is maybe a sign of spiritual sickness or immaturity, then instead of just brushing it off and going, oh, well, well, you know, they'll, they'll learn eventually. No, that we discern and we realize we don't know how much time we have left. I don't know about you, but when the Lord returns, I want to present to him a ministry in my life that shows fruitful, matured believers. I don't want to show him a lot of results of my life where it's just immature people that don't know their left hand from their right hand. They don't know their right from their wrong. Take the opportunity that we have when we get it back to disciple people with discernment. And finally, when you're carried away by the Spirit, direction is determined by God. Your direction is determined by God. Read with me, Acts chapter 8, starting at verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. So this guy was an important guy to the queen. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet of, uh, of Isaiah. So this Ethiopian eunuch, he was not uh, Jewish by ethnicity, but he was getting accustomed to the Jewish scriptures. And apparently he believed the kinds of things that he was reading from the, the, the scriptures. And yet as he's reading in Isaiah, we see in verse 29, the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. 
So Philip ran to him and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? Again, a good example of discipleship. And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that was being read from Isaiah was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shears is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. Verse 34 says, And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this about? Is it himself, or is he talking about someone else? Then Philip, in verse 35, opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told the Ethiopian eunuch the good news about Jesus Christ. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. Did you catch that? The Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Adzatos, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Now there's too much to unpack here, and we don't have the time for that, but I want you to note how in tune Philip is with the Holy Spirit's direction, with God's direction. Now, like I said earlier, the book of Acts is not telling us that we need to hear from an angel and that the the voice of God is going to be audible. But what we get from the rest of the Bible is that we can hear from God. We can know and discern God's will for us and know how to follow him. John 10 says that Jesus is our good shepherd. And it talks about how when our good shepherd speaks, we, as his sheep, hear his voice. Proverbs 16, 9 says, A man's heart plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. I love Psalm 119, 115, which says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And Psalm 32, 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. God wants to give us direction. Looking back at this passage, I want you to notice how many times Philip is responding to God's direction. It says in verse 26 uh, that an angel appears to Philip and says, Rise and go toward the south to the road that leads, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Okay, he does that, and then the Spirit again tells him, Hey, go over to that particular chariot right over there. He does that, and then later, again, the Holy Spirit, remember, carries him away onto the next place that uh, the Lord wants Philip to go. And what does he do all along the way? It says in verse 40 that wherever he was going uh, back to Caesarea, he was, no matter what the town was that he passed through, he preached the gospel wherever he went. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are carried away by the Spirit, that's that's what you do. Ideally, right? We, We preach the gospel wherever we go. I want you to think about this for a moment. Even though the church building is vacant, the church isn't empty. The church has been deployed. And if you are a member of the church and you are carried away by the Holy Spirit, then you are going to allow God to direct you wherever he wants you to go. And right now, that might be in your living, to your living room couch. It might be staying in your living room. But here's something I've noticed, at least online, is that Christian friends of mine, people who I've not um, heard anything of spiritually online in the past, they're starting to get vocal about their faith. In fact, I, I, I believe that some people are being more public about their faith right now in the privacy of their own home. I was on social media and uh, uh, one of the people that I follow um, wrote something sort of spiritual that I had not seen them write before and this is what she wrote. As the signs of the times lead us to believe the return of Jesus could be soon, I believe we need to get the gospel message out. 
until the good Lord calls me away from this world to come home, I want to make it clear that I believe in Jesus Christ as the true Lord and Savior. Despite the fact that I am human and I fail and sin, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, sacrificed on the cross. Having died for our sins, he rose from the dead on the third day. He loves us all dearly, far more than we deserve, and forgives our sins when we repent, that is, turn from our sins and trust in Jesus alone. His word says, whoever believes in me should not perish, but have eternal life. I'm seeing this kind of thing on social media in ways I've never seen it before. Savior Solomon is one of the Nigerian uh, Air Force pilots who's been attending our church over recent months. And of course, he, he lives in Nigeria, but he's been here for a while now, and he made a decision to get baptized. And so we put it on the calendar. It was scheduled for uh, March 15th, and that was the Sunday, the first Sunday that we had to cancel our services and move them online. And I called him up and I said, hey, I don't know what's going on with all this COVID-19 stuff, but it, church is not happening at the building, so we're not going to baptize you. And he understood. I said, but let's just sort of keep our, you know, keep our finger on the pulse of the situation and we'll get something scheduled. Well, more time went on and we kept meeting online and, and uh, I, I got back in touch with them and I said, yeah, so I don't know when... The, you know, when we're ever going to meet again to have a baptism, we're supposed to be keeping our social distance. I don't know if it's a good idea. He's like, no, I, I need to be baptized. I, I, I need to be baptized. I'm like, I get it. Okay, so let, we'll figure this out. Just you tell me when uh, you have to go home. And he, he goes, well, the military is, is going to, at any time, they can call me back. And I'll, I'll, I, I have to get baptized before I go back home to Nigeria. I said, okay, well, just let me know whenever that is. Well, a few days later, in fact, it was just this last Tuesday, he contacted me and he said, I'm leaving on Thursday. I have to be baptized tomorrow on Wednesday. And so I'm thinking, and I even at one point I asked him, I said, so why can't you just be baptized in Nigeria? I mean, what's the COVID-19 situation like there? And, and he said, it's, it's relatively non-existent. I mean, there's like a hundred and something cases throughout the whole country. And I said, um, okay, but you're, you don't, you don't care just to be baptized back at home? He's like, no, I have to be baptized here. Well, we made it happen. Uh, take a look at this video. And is it your desire to continue to live for Jesus Christ wherever he puts you? And it is, is it your desire to use the word of God, to be involved with prayer, the fellowship of the church, to continue to grow as a follower of Christ? Right, well, on the basis of that, let me, let you know, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> Congratulations. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. So as you can see, we sort of ignored some of those social distancing rules, but that was okay because what you saw in the spa there, that wasn't pool water. That was just a big thing of Purell. So we were okay. It stung a little bit in the eyes, but uh, I, think, I think we're all going to make it. No, but seriously, I, while we were there at baptizing him, I asked him right leading up to it. I said, so can you just tell me, just for the record again, like, why was it so important for you to be baptized now here in America instead of back at home with your family, other people? And he said, Justin, when I, you know, I, I sort of grew up in the church, but when, he, when I became an adult, I, I knew I, I wanted to be baptized. I knew I should take a step of obedience and be baptized. And he said, I scheduled a baptism, but then the military had me do something and I had to postpone it. And then I scheduled another baptism. And then right at the last minute, the military had me do one thing to the next. And I, he said it kept sort of getting postponed. And then over a, a two year period of time while being uh, in training to be a helicopter pilot, he said, I was in two helicopter crashes and neither one of them left a scratch on me. How do you survive a helicopter crash, let alone walk away from two of them, let alone walk away from two of them without a scratch? He said, Justin, the Lord has been so faithful to me. He's increasingly demonstrated his faithfulness to me. 
I have got to go where he's leading me. I have got to be baptized. He's called us to baptism, and I've got to do it. I got it. I understood. Of course, because when we are carried away by the Spirit, we have to go where God is leading. Think about it. If we're not carried away by the Spirit, oh, my baptism got canceled? Okay, no biggie. I'll do it again later. I saw, I'll, when the church meets back up again, I'll fill out a blue card and we'll get it going, I guess. But not for someone who's carried away by the Spirit who says, you know what? Look, there's some water right there. Like the Ethiopian eunuch who says to Philip, what's keeping us from, what's keeping us from performing a baptism right here? There's water right there. Let's get into it right now. They, they weren't wearing their bathing suits. They weren't prepared. They had plenty of other reasons to not do it. But when the Lord directs, we who are carried away by the Spirit want to follow where the Lord leads. I want to leave you with this question. How is the Lord directing you right now? And are you butting heads with God on this? Or are you going with the flow? Are you frustrated that you're stuck at home or have your freedoms limited during this time? Or are you saying, God, what do you have for me? I want to join up with how you're directing me and what you would have for my family in my unique neighborhood, in my unique circumstance. I encourage you with this because things can happen that the Lord uses in magnificent ways. I want you to consider in World War II, everyone in Great Britain was hunkered down for quite some time in fear of the bombings from Germany. No doubt not a fun uh, spot to be in. And yet it was in this time that C.S. Lewis began a radio broadcast, and that broadcast became the book Mere Christianity, one of Christendom's most cherished publications. Isaac Newton was 20 years old when the bubonic plague forced people into their version of social distancing. It was during his year away from Cambridge that he came up with the theory of gravity. Or consider this, it was under house arrest, home confinement, that the Apostle Paul wrote nearly half of the New Testament. And when you read some of his works during that time and see how much joy he had in the face of persecution, you might think even he was getting a little carried away. How about you? Are you being carried away by the Spirit to that even sadness, grief, oppression can be joy and contentment because of your trusting in the Lord and what he has for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may we please see the oppression, the pressure, the feeling of being stifled in our lives right now. May we see that as a great opportunity that you have before us. And may we begin to discern the ways in which you would have us proclaim the gospel and disciple others in unique ways during this time. And when we get back to being able to meet face to face with people, may we cherish the ability to disciple one another through the discernment of your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that we would be so carried away by your spirit that we just are asking each and every day, Lord, where do you want to take me today? What do you want to do with me? Do you want me to witness to that person? Should I start a Bible study over the internet to help uh, minister to this particular group? What elderly neighbor might I be able to reach out to and help, with, help deliver groceries to or, or in, a, in some other way help? Lord, please engage all of our senses right now when we're feeling honestly that a lot of our senses are muted. We're, we're feeling in many ways depressed Lord, give us contentment and joy like never before because your spirit is carrying us along and guiding us each and every day. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We look forward to seeing you on Easter Sunday. We'll catch you online. See you then.